by the rivers of Babylon. There we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem's fall, how they said, tear it down, tear it down, down to its foundations. O daughter Babylon, you devastator, happy shall they be who pay you back what you have done to us. Happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against the rock. This, yes, even this, is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Perhaps today, our corporate response should be punctuated with a question mark after a reading such as this. Thanks be to God. Brian Shivers, have you lost your mind might just be the question that you're asking this morning. Of all of the psalms to pick, you pick this one. I know, right? For those of you who have been here in the sanctuary with us since early June or have been listening online, you know that we have been spending time in the psalms as a part of our summer sermon series entitled One Faith, Many Voices. And for those of you who are here for the very first time, or maybe here for the first time this summer, welcome. And allow me to get you caught up a little bit on the ground that we have covered. So far this summer, we've read Psalm 46, Psalm 133, and Psalm 146. We've been encouraged to consider the presence of God, the unity of the faith, and the manner in which we praise God in both our words and our lives. And now... Here we are, and Brian, a pastor who doesn't get to preach all that often, chooses this psalm. Psalm 137, a psalm that is often left out of our lectionaries and is forgotten in our prayers. There literally were 149 other possibilities, and I landed here. Well, after uh, Dr. Galloway and the other pastors that have preached so far, made their selections. There were like 143 possibilities, but I still selected this one. What in the world 
could I have possibly been thinking? Who wants to read such a psalm on a beautiful day like this? Now trust me, I have thought these very thoughts and quite a few others as I've been putting this sermon together. However, however, every time I thought about moving in another direction, something kept pulling me back. So what is it about this psalm? Perhaps what drew me to this psalm was a bit of a secret rebellious streak that calls me toward that which you aren't supposed to say or that which you shouldn't preach about. Growing up, I was a rule follower, which doesn't shock any of you that know me. But I also had a penchant for getting other people to do things that pushed the limits a little bit. You could often hear me say things like, hey, you know what would be funny? It would be funny if you would... Or I'd lean over and elbow somebody and say, hey, you should try... And then my friends would get the laugh, or more importantly, they would get in trouble. There's safety in being the behind-the-scenes guy, what is called the class comedian and not the class clown. You see, the class clown is the one that's up front and gets in trouble or gets all the laughs. The class comedian is the one in the background who puts the class clown up to the things that the class clown gets in trouble for. There's also comfort, to be honest, in what is called being an occasional preacher. Risks come a little bit easier because next Sunday... Somebody else will be in this pulpit, and we all will have forgotten about these brief moments together today. At least one can only hope that would be the case, especially if things don't go well. I was also drawn to Psalm 137 because it's a psalm that doesn't neatly fit into one of our common agreed-upon categories of psalms. And I find that there's something wonderful about that. It reflects our lives that aren't neatly packaged and often defy explanation. So perhaps the reason I'm drawn to this psalm is because of its peculiar structure. It most clearly resembles a psalm of lament, which, by the way, make up a full one-third of our Psalter. But this psalm even goes against convention as a psalm of lament. But I must confess that what really continued to draw me to Psalm 137 is something more. What intrigues me most about this psalm is the raw and absolutely terrifying honesty the psalmist displays, the sheer strength of the psalmist's lament, the awful beauty of the psalmist's words, the horrifying manner in which the psalmist closes the psalm with frightening words that most would never imagine using, even in their deepest despair and darkest moments of revenge. Yes, this honesty The power of the words and the raw expression of anger is what draws me to this psalm. In this psalm, I find a mirror that reflects my most desperate moments and the thoughts that I would never dare allow to spill from my lips. Psalm 137 is unique in many ways. One of its distinctive characteristics appears at its beautiful poetic beginning. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there, we hung up our harps, for our captors asked us for songs and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, sing us one of your songs of Zion. This magnificent and often quoted beginning gives us a frame for the remainder of the song. The author of the psalm locates it in a specific time and place, which is unusual for a psalm to have such a distinct and historic context. This setting is the Babylonian captivity of the nation of Israel in the 6th century BCE. The brutality of the Babylonian captors was unprecedented. They took captive all of the noble persons, the artisans, and the priests. And like a plague of locusts, They left nothing but destruction and desperation in their wake. Towns were leveled and crops were destroyed. And the temple, the dwelling place of the divine, the one true God of Israel, was raised to its foundation. The people of Israel were left left without a homeland and without hope. 
and all appeared to be lost. Those who remained behind were left without that which they needed to survive, and those who were taken into captivity had everything taken from them, even their God. Now, whether this psalm grows directly out of that time of captivity or from the pen of one who was reflecting back upon this desperate time matters little. The lament of the psalmist was real. The anger can be felt in the words that were chosen. And who can blame this author for using such harsh words? Words that we may desperately wish were not included in the corpus of Scripture has a frame of reference, and that frame is war, devastation, grief, anger, and desperation. And we are uncomfortable with these words with good reason. We claim that we would never utter them for ourselves. Now please note that the psalmist's words do not reveal any expectation of action, of retribution, or violence on the part of the psalmist. The psalmist understands that vengeance belongs to God and not to mere mortals. These words are not about vengeance. These awful and intriguing words reveal the depth of pain and the anguish of that which lies behind them. So, Can we imagine someone who might utter such words today? Can we think of anyone for whom these words might seem appropriate? There are many, and we see their faces every day. The father in Syria who has buried his entire family after yet another bombing on his town. The sister who is raising her three siblings in sub-Saharan Africa alone. The mother whose son was lost to the violence of the streets in Chicago. The woman whose recent diagnosis fills her with fear for the future of her small, young family. The young man who is afraid that he might not get to see 21 just because of the color of his skin. The child who woke up this morning and the reality of their world was different than the one that they could imagine. Yes, it doesn't take much imagination to visualize who might use these words who might offer this lament. There are many for whom these words would come naturally, and in this psalm, we come face to face with their very real pain. Also, in this psalm, we hear the voices of the captors mocking their captives. Sing us one of your acute songs of your impotent God who couldn't save you from our wrath. Sing of your glorious temple that now remains in ruins. Sing of your destroyed cities. Sing of your lost loved ones. Sing of your missed opportunities. Sing, say the victors, the oppressors. Sing us one of your songs. And in the face of this mockery, the psalmist's instruments remain silent. But the words continue to flow. And these words, they reveal something about us individually and corporately, and we are frightened by them. I'll confess, I'm frightened by them. And perhaps it isn't just the words that I fear, for they reveal not just that I am despicable and capable of horrible things. I already know that. We already know that about ourselves. Perhaps what Psalm 137 reveals most is a fear of brutal honesty with God and an unwillingness to sit with our lament over the way things are, the violence of our world and our lost dreams of how we once thought things could be. And in our fear, we ignore this text and those like it in our lectionaries and in our prayers as if they never existed. Instead of courageously joining our voices with the psalmists, and those who dare to echo the psalmist's words in their desperate lament. Wishing texts like this away is akin to asking someone who has experienced the most difficult, 
most painful chapter of their life to just get over it already. Or telling them, be patient, everything will be all right in time. And yet we do that too, don't we? Why? I think it's because we're uncomfortable with grief, with anger, with lament. There's no time for nonsense such as that in our high energy, bright, joyful world or in a faith that is preoccupied with making sure that everyone feels good and is surrounded by only happy thoughts. So, we create things that offer nothing but artificial luminosity to our darkness. In Psalm 137, one commentator wrote, If one subverts the lament and swiftly moves to praise, the lament is lost with disastrous consequences. When one rushes through a lament to find happiness, genuine covenant interaction is lost. Anger and loss are a necessary part of intimacy, genuine covenant, and interaction. Without them, a relationship remains superficial. Ridding ourselves, our scriptures, and our faith of texts such as these is not an honest reflection of our lives. Doing so is not a fair representation of a faith that is integrated into the nitty-gritty of our everyday life. Without these texts and that which they represent, faith is nothing more than a manufactured, plasticine fantasy world in which none of us can dwell with any integrity. With these texts and the truth they reveal about us and about the divine, faith becomes real. Through them, we are invited to live into this messy world. In his book on Lamentations, Sung Chan Ra writes, the balance in scripture between praise and lament is lost in the ethos and worldview of American Christianity with its dominant language of praise. Any theological reflection that emerges from the suffering of the have-nots cannot, can be minimized in the onslaught of the triumphalism of the haves. He continues, to only have a theology of celebration at the cost of a theology of suffering is incomplete. The intersection of the two threads provides the opportunity to engage in the fullness of the gospel message. Lament and praise must go hand in hand. But the American Christian community is afraid of that, and we should respond to our broken world. And the major themes, the importance of lament, the necessary of, necessity of engaging with suffering, the power of encountering the other, should lead us to a theology of lament that corrects the triumphalism of Christianity in the West. The text of Psalm 137 and texts like it do indeed reveal something about us individually and corporately. And we meet ourselves in these words perhaps as if for the first time. And through them we confront the reality of our longings, our fears, and the reality of who we are. But this strange, beautiful text goes even further than that if we will only allow it to do so. Not only do these difficult words reveal us to ourselves, but they also reveal to us something about God. No matter how frightening our thoughts and the words we choose to us and to use may be, they do not have the power to change the character of God. The covenantal God who will never leave us even in our descent into the mud and mire of life. So yes, it is the raw honesty of the psalmist that draws me to these words this morning. For somehow, strangely in them, I find hope. Yes, hope. This is a God that dwells not somewhere out there, but here, in between, and here, inside. And this God is not detached from our frustrations and laments. In fact, this God can be found 
even in the midst of them. And we do a disservice to faith by not acknowledging them, by not speaking them out loud. So here is hope, my friends. We can be confident in our lament, for God hears, God sits with, God participates in our lament. Hope is found in the promise of the God who will meet us within our lament, as well as the passages of Scripture and of life that do not make sense. Those chapters we wish weren't even there. We fool ourselves into believing that life would be so much easier if texts like this did not exist, that faith would make so much more sense without them. No. Faith only makes sense with these words. For it is there within our lament, our brutal honesty, that we find hope, we find freedom, that we find God. Scholar, author, and speaker Brene Brown recently said in an interview on her religious life, quote, I thought faith would say, I'll take away the pain and discomfort. But what it ended up saying is that I'll sit with you in it. I never thought until I found it that that would be enough, but it's perfect. I don't feel alone in it anymore. Because love weeps. This is the truth of the God of incarnation. A God who is born through water, blood, and the agony of a mother deep within the throes of labor. A God who not only hears our pain and grief, but bears our pain and grief with us. Lament reveals not our weaknesses as humans, but the strength of a God who holds this space for us within our lamentation. The Incarnation invites us into the fullness of the human experience, even our lament, anger, and despair. It is there Christ meets us. The God of mercy is big enough to handle it all. This is good news for the mess and confusion we often find ourselves living in. Friends, let us courageously and confidently join our voices with the psalmist in raising our songs of lament. Lament over the way things are. Lament over the way things we'd hoped things would be. Lament over the state of the world and the things that we cannot control. Lament over the way in which we have treated our neighbors. Lament over that which we have done. Lament over that which we have left undone. Lament over the felt absence of a God we are convinced could and would do something about all of it. Lament in the face of those who would mock our pain and demand us for evidence of our God. For there, in our seasons of lament, is where we discover ourselves. It is where we can find the depth of mercy. It is where we will find the divine. The God who holds our grandest desires and our deepest secrets meets us there. The God who is incarnation is familiar with our lament. Amen.